Hey guys, I finally did it. I published the book. It came out Fool's Errand. Time to end the war in Afghanistan. It's at foolserrand.us. Foolserrand.us. It's on Amazon in paperback and in Kindle. And I got a brand new blurb from Colonel Douglas McGregor. He says he recommended it to be part of the coursework at the Army Command and General Staff College. That's how much he liked it. Great read, vitally important, brilliant achievement, he said. So check that out, foolserrand.us. War is the improvement of investment climates by other means, Clausewitz for dummies. The Scott Horton Show. Taking out Saddam Hussein turned out to be a pretty good deal. They hate our freedoms. We're dealing with Hitler Revisited. We couldn't wait for that Cold War to be over, could we? So we can go and play with our toys in the sand. Go and play with our toys in the sand. No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. Today, I authorize the Armed Forces of the United States to begin military action in Libya. That action has now begun. When the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. I cannot be silent in the face of the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. All right, you guys. I'm Scott Horton. On the line, I got our friend Joe Loria. He's in Irbil, Kurdistan. He lives there now. Uh, his latest book is uh, really it's by Hillary Clinton. It's called How I Lost. For those of you who've uh, who thought that you had to read what happened in order to find out Hillary's point of view. Actually, it turns out that uh, Joe beat her to the punch. And really all he did is he curated all of her most important statements. And it's just a book of block quotes as edited by my main man here. And it's really great. It'll make you laugh some of the stuff in there. And it'll remind you of the horror that really is Hillary Clinton and, and why she really lost. Welcome back to the show. How you doing? Thank you, Scott, and thank you for that plug. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I actually, I've read quite a few reviews of her book just because I hate her so much that I really, really enjoy her unending misery and all of her poor sportsmanship here. It annoys other people, but I just think it's just great. I can't watch it on TV because I can't stand her voice, but I love reading about it. It's just hilarious to me. It never goes away. It, I hope it never goes away. Um, <laughs> she, she's still hard at it, you know, uh, blaming anyone and everything uh, but herself for that catastrophe. Uh, I'm, so. I'm actually reading the book because I'm going to review it, and my publisher will send it around, and I'll publish it a few places. Cool. Oh, yeah, I know what so I was going to say. I just started talking about how much I enjoy your misery so much I forgot my point. I had a point, which was, um, one of the most insightful reviews of her book that I read, believe it or not, was actually at the World Socialist website. And I thought that unlike what people might expect, they really refused to buy into probably what I would think would be her most appealing narrative, that all those right-wing, working-class white people are all just bad people kind of thing. And the World Socialist website just said, no, there's just none of that at all. And in fact, you can tell that she keeps saying white as though to imply that they're all deplorable people. But the truth is the working class of all races at least stayed home and refused to support her uh, if they didn't outright cross over and vote for him. And that kind of thing. And just, you know, I like a little intellectual honesty by people who, you know, maybe it would be easier for them to just go along with more conventional narratives at least on the the things that would coincide with what you would think they would want to say or something like that you know but they they really let her have it i thought it was very insightful and very good um, yeah well anybody anybody who gives it to her right now uh, she deserves it yeah. i have to tell you well um, and i mean the quotes are her just i'm not going anywhere and i'm just reveling in it i just am like yes please continue crying i mean she said one of the quotes the other day was well, geez, yeah, depending. I mean, it was the way they asked the question, I guess, to set it up. But still, she said, yeah, you know, if bad news comes back about this Russia thing, then yes, I'm totally open to questioning the results of the election and whether they should be overturned. Like, she's really still holding out hope that somehow it's still not too late for her to be the you're president not, at this you're point. You're not kidding me, are you? Because I did not see that or hear that. Yeah, she did say it. And so the thing is, it's not like she's any closer to that than she was able to get the CIA to convince the Electoral College to support her or right. throw it to the House or right. anything like that. But the point is right. that 
She supports these fantasies. She buys into them. She had, even in the Electoral College thing in December, she had her people like putting out feelers and seeing whether, yeah, what can we do? Which all can we get Morell and Brennan to testify? And what all can we do? To She thought that that was a possibility then, even though it should have been absolutely apparent that it was not. I mean, these electors all come from the 50 states. They're not, you know. Anyway, um well, and I, so know, for her to still be saying that now, in, in September yeah. of the yeah. next year, almost a full year after her defeat, to be saying, oh, yeah, no, I'm open to overturning the results of the election if we can pin this thing on Putin severely enough. I, I just love it. I mean, it doesn't pretend even anything like an attempt for that to even happen to me. It's just an indication of how insane she is and how miserable she is, and that's why I like it. So. Well, I think a good part of the reason for the un still unproven allegations of Russiagate was the very thing you're mentioning to try to overturn the results of the election. I wrote an article that was on the Huffington Post three days before the election. Anybody can go and see it, in which I predicted if she would lose. And at that point, nobody thought she would. But if she should lose, she would blame Russia, yes, to try to get the Electoral College to change its vote. And if that didn't work, to try to get uh, the Congress to not endorse the election. And that didn't work. And now she's still at it again, as you're saying, that that is just astounding, uh, that she cannot understand that people voted against her, particularly working class people of all races, as you said, uh, because of her, not because Russia, they were watching RT. Nobody watches RT in the U.S. I mean, right. Uh, it's nonsense. It's well, and as that as that World Socialist website pointed out in their review too, it ain't just her. It's that she represents the status quo, and in her book, she argues absolutely. that the status quo rules, and everybody knows that that she was the right candidate, the most qualified, the best policies, and all these things, and she just could not accept, as they put it, she couldn't accept that anyone would have a different opinion than that. If you have a different opinion than that, that's fake news. That you think everything isn't perfect. That's a lie that you think everything that that the status quo that she represents isn't just right and and that and so therefore she just she has to blame Putin or Comey or Loria or whoever's fault it is maybe China I, wish, I was thinking we should float that one the Chinese hacked you too dude and see if we can get her to bite on that I the wish Koreans. she'd blame me that would be a great publicity for the book but they yeah. studiously avoided any comment it did get a mention in a New Yorker article about Assange, just the title. Oh, that's Now, they're not going to talk about the book, but she's proven in, in what's happened, as much as I've read already, that she's incapable of caring about average people. She's just plainly incapable. She served up bromides about them during the campaign, and it's the same thing in the book now. Mm -hmm. The thing is, uh, the two people running for president last time, and in general, in most uh, elections in the U.S., both candidates are trying to outlie each other about how much they care about average Americans. Turns out Trump was a better liar than she was. That's why he won, I think. Right. Uh, of course. I mean, that was his meta message, even when he couldn't pronounce it right. Basically, his overall theme when he remembered it was that he's too rich to be corrupted by anyone else from here forward. That basically he was his own man. He couldn't be bought because he already was an owner. And so therefore... Um, he would just do the right thing no matter what anybody thought. And so people right, thought, hey, he there's an independence that goes with that, you know? He doesn't care about working people. And he fooled enough to think that he did. Right. And I don't know whether he cares about, uh, uh, you know, some kind of rapprochement or detente with Russia either, which is absolutely essential right now. Um, this has been another reason why I think Russia Gate became such an issue because the, they he was threatening to foil you know, the, the aggressive plans the U.S. has against Russia. Right. And in terms of RT and any influence it had on the election, what you've got here is a situation, and I've experienced it more than once uh, working for big corporate newspapers, where I've pitched stories that were critical of the U.S., uh, and then they were never accepted. So there's widespread suppression of critical news of U.S. foreign policy. But I was given a platform as a lot of American journalists are on Russian TV, on RT specifically, or quoted in Sputnik, so there's where I revealed some of these things I couldn't say in an American newspaper, but not for lack of trying. But then it comes back and they say it's propaganda now. So they twice, first they suppress it, then they call it propaganda if it should eke out through a different platform on Russia today. And to say that that's what influenced the electorate against Hillary Clinton is just, just mind-boggling. Um, but it doesn't die down. This thing is not dying down. It's really yeah. extraordinary. You know, I quit Facebook a couple of years ago, about three years ago now. 
Um, but uh, I, w- I was signed in under a buddy's identity to check out the skate group. And I was trolling around a little bit in the feed and just seeing what people were saying. People I don't even know, but just seeing, you know. And they were saying, oh, my God, everybody, look. Facebook has been compromised by the Russians. And they bought some ads on Facebook to make us all vote for Trump. Oh, my God. And then the other people are reacting and saying either, oh, no, it is all true. Or, yeah, I don't know, man. It's just a couple of Facebook ads. You know, something more reasonable. But it seemed like this was a big conversation going on. And what nobody seemed to recognize what I think you were hitting on there, that you know, maybe even more than half of the reason for all the Russia attacks on Trump is really about Putin and Russia and using Trump to beat them over the head as much as it is about using them to beat Trump over the head and to try to make sure to maintain the current Cold War. It's not a new Cold War. It's been going on since George W. Bush, really Bill Clinton, but but George W. Bush, especially and Obama, both expanded NATO and and did a lot of other things and made it worse and worse and worse. And they wanted, I totally agree with you, that to them, I mean, you can see this especially right in Brennan and Morell and all the CIA guys who came out against Trump, that they were terrified that he was going to make peace with Russia. And you know what, Joe? Did you see this thing in BuzzFeed last week where you got to love the spin on it? It was completely crazy. But the story was about how Putin offered explicitly offered an entire reproachment on every issue that they could think of uh, to become friends yeah. on and that heroically the CIA and the advisors and whoever prevented this from ever getting anywhere was the spin in, in BuzzFeed. But it was he was offering peace and negotiations on nukes and everything, I think. Well, look, look they, Clinton, from the Clinton administration on, they had Yeltsin, who was an American puppet, who opened the doors to Wall Street and other American interests to go in there in league with local oligarchs to rape the country and screw the population. I was there in 1995 in Moscow. People were living in the streets. Policemen were asking bribes. It was a dangerous place. It was chaos. Uh, Then Putin came along and ended that. He closed the door to a great extent to Wall Street, threw a lot of these oligarchs in jail, and he restored Russian pride in their country and, and sovereignty. And I went back to Moscow uh, exactly 20 years of the month uh, later, and I saw a clean, modern European city there. And he's popular. I'm not going to say anything about Putin's domestic policy because I'm not familiar with that. I've never covered Russian domestic politics. But 80 percent of Russian people like him. Part of it is because he has stood up and closed the door to the Americans who want to get back in there the way they were with Yeltsin. So they need a Yeltsin-like figure again. And Putin is stopping them. And here's Trump saying he's going to you know, make a detente with Putin. That's why they can't accept Putin's offer of, uh, of uh, agreements across the board, as you just mentioned. They don't want him to stand there. They want him out. They want their own man in there somehow. And Trump was not the guy who was going to facilitate that. And I suspect Hillary Clinton would have. So this is a serious matter. But, you know, someday we better get some evidence about actual uh, Russian hacking and Russian influence in this election. What they, If, in fact, they did give the emails to WikiLeaks, which WikiLeaks denies... They were still true, all the things. There was nothing false that came out. We, The electorate was benefited from hearing uh, this inside information from the Clinton campaign. You know, Trump was an open book. He, I mean, he was saying one stupid thing after the other. The video came out about him grabbing women. All these things, I mean, he, uh, and he, it, didn't, it, it didn't hurt him in the end. But Hillary Clinton was secretive about what her real plans were. So this was a great service, whoever provided those emails. What is wrong with transparency? It opens. If you're against WikiLeaks, then you're for the state against the people, in my view. And uh, uh, so I, I don't see where, you know, nobody's ever proven that the emails were decisive in her defeat. It may have hurt. What it did more is to confirm what people suspected of her. And that is what my book is based on, the emails from WikiLeaks. Assange wrote the forward. I just provide the annotation and the analysis. Uh, that's why we call it uh, How I Lost for Hillary Clinton. But I happen to be in Iraq now. Why don't we talk about the referendum? <laughs> I know. I wasn't even I wasn't even going to say a thing about Hillary except the book, but I just love this conversation so much. It's really my fault because I was indulging in my joy That's at her fine. misery there so much. But it's, hey, she's the one who's continuing this whole argument. I keep saying this on Twitter, and I know I'm wearing it out, but, I mean, it's actually kind of really meaningful to me, Joe, that <laughs> Richard Nixon shut the hell up and went home. 
after Jack Kennedy actually stole the election from him. (laughs) Stole two major states, Texas and Illinois, and I don't know what else. And stole the election from him. And Nixon, that dirty SOB, that infamous, most resigned president of all, said, you know what, it would be bad for the country for me to sit here and fight about this. I'm not going to do this. And he went home to California and he lost his run for governor and whatever, whatever. And he may have even hinted that, yeah, I think JFK stole it. But he didn't fight about it like this. He didn't carry on and write a book whining about it and, and, and disputing was whether Jack Kennedy was the legitimate commander-in-chief of the armed forces yeah. at the moment or not. And these kinds of things like she's doing right now. And there was evidence for it, as you just said. Same with Al Gore. Al Gore, uh, he... right. Should have probably should have fought it, I think, but he did not. Right. Uh, at least when the Supreme Court decided it, that was certainly a controversial, maybe the, one of the most, if not the most controversial election. It doesn't seem like it was a legitimate victory by Bush, but Al Gore did not do it. What Hillary Clinton doing is doing now is uh, uh, just unbelievable because there's no evidence where in Florida, if they did, had done a statewide recount as newspaper investigations later showed, Gore would have won. So he had the evidence and he for the good of the country, for whatever reason, did not fight it anymore. Didn't write books complaining about it, but here she is. She's an extraordinarily uh, divisive and uh, sorry figure right now. But, you know, I, I really don't feel sorry for her. She says at one point in the book that one way she coped with her defeat is to just put her head in a pillow and scream. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I felt like doing after five minutes of reading this book. <laughs> I mean, to me, I just love that so much. I mean, even the pictures of her when she was in the woods, you could tell she'd been crying and crying and crying. And, of course, that means hysterical, angry, throwing things, crying, not just sobbing, but, you know, being an insane person like she is. So, you know, I don't this know. This book was for her fans. This book was written for her fans. and They'll, they'll buy it. She's, she's outrageously charging money to go to, to her book tour to see her speak, which is just beyond belief. Um, most authors cannot get their publishers to pay a dime for promotion, promotional events. And here she's getting paid for her promotional events, let alone having to pay. So, uh, you know, let her make her money. And you now people in the Democratic Party are speaking up, at least anonymously, that she ought to just go, that, go away. Yeah. And that she's hurting the party, particularly in this fight with uh, the so-called progressive wing, the Sanders Democrats. Yep. Uh, and the fact that she took out Sanders in this book, too, although I haven't finished reading it yet, but what I've read from the excerpts and other reviews, it's kind of, you know, uh, ungrateful, to say the least, because the guy angered a lot of his supporters by backing her and by campaigning for her. And then she turns around and slams him and blames him for her loss, because as if he didn't have a right to actually run. He was supposed to have just been a foil for her coronation, but he, <laughs> the damn guy actually almost beat her. So that she... That's, an unforgivable act, a politician to challenge in a primary, where she had her own DNC uh, trying to rig the thing for her as best as they could. It's it's just, the whole thing is... Well, and the quotes, too, where she's saying, yeah, he would always just try to one-up me by um, saying, oh, eight-minute abs, well, I'll do seven-minute abs. Like, as though he's not a lifelong committed communist. You know, as though we don't know that he was a radical leftist back when she was a Goldwater girl. And we don't know that he fought in the civil rights movement back in the 60s. We don't know that he's always referred to himself as a socialist and an independent far to the left of the Democrats, even as he caucused with them. No, all of a sudden, he was just plagiarizing her, but just stepping one half a step to the left just to steal her thunder. Huh? That's the narrative of last year. I really I just can't try to remember that way. No matter or I can't remember it that way, no matter how hard I try. He yeah. exposed her as the phony progressive she says she is. She yep. did not accept single-payer care or a number of issues with, uh, you know, on college debt, etc. There were a number of issues that Sanders made her look weak and phony, which she is. But uh, without Sanders there, she wouldn't have been exposed. And I think she's angry about that. She ought to just go away, I agree. Although, uh, you know, there was a spike in sales of the book when hers came out because we're... We're offering it as what really happened. And uh, when my review gets out, I hope it gets some attention. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> that'd be cool if you can get it where Amazon says these are often bought together. You know, when yeah. people buy hers, they buy this too. And then, oh, here's yeah. the transcript of what you told those Wall Street banks. Well, it's I see. finally available as an ebook on Amazon. But uh, 
Anyway, uh, you know. yeah, let's talk about Kurdistan. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. So, listen, uh, there are varying degrees of uh, age and experience on these questions listening to the show. So, I'll try to set it up here just real quick as best I can. When you picture Iraq, don't you, everybody, picture kind of a real short, squat California shaped country over there, basically, more or less, uh, to the uh, north and northwest of Arabia. West of Iran, east of the Levant, Israel, and all that. Okay, so uh, in the very north of there, up in the mountains, is the Iraqi segment of Kurdistan. And Kurdistan is a region of the Kurdish ethnic people that is, what, pentasected? Is that how you say it? It's, it's divided by Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, and then also a little bit up into Azerbaijan and Armenia, I believe. You could correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. And yeah. they've never had their own state, and they're uh, constantly having problems. And they were the, the Iraqi Kurds were certainly oppressed by Saddam Hussein, and then they were part of the alliance with the Shiites and the Americans in the war to overthrow the Ba'athists and install the new regime in power. And now, it, very importantly, I think, Joe, am I right? They are about to finally vote. They've been putting it off, but they're about to finally vote on full-fledged independence from Iraqi Shia stand in Baghdad. Is that correct? That's what they're intending to do on Monday, to hold a referendum. And now they used to put this off, and they used to cancel it, and they used to say, oh, well, we were going to, but now something came up. But this time that's not happening. They're really going through with it, it looks like? It does look that way. Uh I will correct one thing you said, by Good. the way. There was, there was uh, the Republic of Mahabad, which was in north, is in northwest Iran, which is the only Kurdish state that has ever existed, at least in modern times. Uh, and that was, it lasted 12 months in 1946. Oh, the Iranian government, crushed, the Iranian government crushed it and executed its leaders uh, a few months later. Right. But that now, still didn't include any of the rest of Kurdistan. Nothing, right? That was still a little piece. Just a right. little part of northwest Iran under Soviet uh, occupation, then the Soviets left, uh, and then six or seven months later, the Iranians crushed it. I see. That's just a footnote in history. Thank but you. I appreciate. Not been a Kurdish. There's not been a Kurdish state. This referendum is going to be held on Monday. There's enormous efforts being made uh, to stop it from various quarters, which I'd like to get into each country and how they're, what they're saying now and how they're likely to respond. Go for it, the please. Thing, the key thing I think to understand is um, the referendum will almost certainly go ahead on Monday. People are celebrating all week here. They're driving around in their cars with hanging out the side windows with big Kurdish flags flowing, screaming and honking horns as if they've just won the World Cup. I saw one with an American flag. I don't understand that because the U.S. is officially against this referendum. And I've seen photographs, although I've not seen my own eyes here in the streets, uh, an Israeli flag. And I'll get to that being also flown here. Um, the key thing to understand is, and I was saying this before, Barzani's son, who was the prime minister, said uh, the other day uh, that this referendum is a referendum for independence, but on, on September 25th, Monday, but the day after they will not declare independence. Most Kurds here believe they're already independent. They act as though they are an independent nation. Well, they sure do have autonomy in real life, don't they? They have, they have they're a semi-autonomous state. What they've got really is a flag and an army, the Peshmerga, and a good army that's contributed greatly to defeating ISIS in Mosul and elsewhere. And they have a flag. They have parliament that had not sat and not met for two years until last week when they met to approve this referendum. And I think they're going to meet again on Saturday. But they, so they, they, they don't have the modern infrastructure. Well, let's put it this way. I mean, you may go back. The, the Montevideo Convention of the 1920s set out the rules, internationally agreed upon rules, for what constitutes a state. And there are three requirements. One, there should be an ethnic group that's more or less homogeneous, which is absolutely true here. The Kurds are the vast majority. There are Turkmen, there are Yazidi, there are Assyrian Christians who speak Aramaic, but they're in a minority. The vast majority of people, and there are some Arabs, the vast majority are Kurds. So they require, require number one, they fulfill. Number two, they must have a contigu contiguous territory in which they live. And they have that. There is a Kurdistan region run by this Kurdistan regional government, semi-autonomous. The third one is the key, which is it needs international recognition. 
Now, the Palestinians also have those two, first two, and they've got the third. They have 130 nations that have recognized Palestine. Some of them have embassies in their capital. The problem with the Palestinians, even though I think, I argue legally they are a state because they require, fulfilled all three, they, the political situation, they don't have political recognition of the neighbors of Israel, obviously, which is more than a neighbor, it's an occupier, and the United States. So politically, it's not a feasible state, but legally it, it is a state, in my opinion. Where the Kurds, the recognition is their problem. Right now, only three nations have said they would support and recognize an independent Kurdistan. Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Israel. Yeah. And Israel has been involved here for a while. They've been big supporters of Kurdish independence. One could uh, argue that that's part of Israeli general defense uh, idea of breaking up Arab states. Yeah, well, listen, uh, um, specifically, remember there was a Seymour Hersh piece in 2004 or 2005 called Plan B, where, right. you know, this was all supposed to work out and the Shiites were going to be compliant and put all this pressure on Iran for us and all this. Well, that didn't work out. So Plan B will break off Kurdistan. And that was the Israeli policy back then. And remember yeah. also when Rand Paul went and kissed Sheldon Adelson's ring and begged him for money when he first started running for president, it was just a few days later, I think may have been one week later, that he came out proposing and you know, saying that America ought to guarantee and prom you know, guarantee the borders and promise an independent Kurdistan. So we know yeah. where he got that you know, it was pretty obvious where he got that from. Well, that's right. I think uh, so. The problem is they don't have enough countries recognizing, and the countries that matter here really matter are totally opposed. I'm going to go through them one by one if I can. But the key thing to remember is that this vote will take place, and Barzani's son, who's the prime minister, said Barzani, Barzani is the longtime leader uh, of the Iraqi Kurds, and he said his son just the other day in an interview with a local press here, that they will not declare independence on September 26th. They will use this as a negotiating tool with Baghdad. This is what I believed all along, and now he's said it. They are not going to become an independent country. On the Although almost all Kurds that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to many, think they are, a, are already independent, but you know they ignore their passports, which are is Iraqi, and they ignore the money here, which are Iraqi dinos. So they... They are not a part, in their minds, they're not part of the uh, Republic of Iraq. They are an independent country. That's psychologically. And they are, they're going to feel even strong, more strongly, obviously, on Monday when they vote 90 to 95% is expected to approve this referendum. Many will think that means they're independent. But now Barzani's son has come right out and said it does not mean they're independent. They are not going to declare independence, but they're going to use the threat of declaring independence as a way to get independence through negotiations with Baghdad. So how have they all reacted? The U.S. has on record said they're absolutely opposed to this referendum, to the point where last night, on Wednesday night, the, the State Department issued a statement saying that the U.S., the U.N., and the U.K. were willing to work on a new initiative to facilitate the dialogue between Baghdad and Iraq so that these issues, and there are many we could talk about, should be resolved, mostly the disputed areas, which is a very sticky part of this. Right. Not all of this. Some of it is claimed by Baghdad. Some of it is claimed by Erbil. So the U.S. said yesterday that if the referendum is conducted, it's highly unlikely there will be negotiations with Baghdad at all. And that above all, that the international offer of support will be foreclosed. So they are threatening hardball against uh, Erbil, saying, if you hold this referendum, we're not going to facilitate talks, and there won't be talks with Baghdad. And you're stuck. Whereas the Kurds are going to use this in their back pocket, we got this referendum, and now we're going to go talk to Baghdad again and say, now we want this, this, and that, which, has, which is going to amount to independence in the end. Yeah. Now, the Baghdad government first uh, reacted with bluster, saying they would send, they could send tanks here. Now, this is totally unrealistic to think that the Iraqi National Army could invade and win a war against the Peshmerga, which would fight desperately, uh, as they did against Saddam and earlier Iraqi governments. This is a long-going battle between the Kurds and the Arabs here in Iraq. But even if they should win this war, they don't have the resources to control or occupy this country. There would be guerrilla warfare. It's just absolutely unrealistic. So, And, and, uh, and then uh, Al-Abadi, the prime minister here, 
backed off that and said they won't, you know, they're not going to take military intervention. But Baghdad, backed by the Arab League and the U.S. and the Europeans, uh, are saying, you know, they don't, they're not going to, uh, there's going to be trouble if you have this referendum, but they can't really do anything militarily anyway. Yeah. Second is Turkey. How will Turkey react? Very interesting. Turkish Security Council, National Security Council is meeting on Saturday to say what they're going to do about this. At the General Assembly podium yesterday on Wednesday, uh, Erdogan, the president of Turkey, said that they call on Kurdish regional government to abort their referendum. And he said this, ignoring Turkey can deprive the Kurdistan regional government of the opportunities they currently enjoy. I'll interpret that. This region, which I've been living in here, is almost totally dependent on Turkey for goods and supplies. Uh, there's no other exit. There's no other way out or in, really, into this region. Iran border is kind of militarized and not, uh, you know, you could easily go, Kurds can easily visit Iran without visas. It's kind of good relations with the Iranian government. But and there's some Iranian goods that come here. There's no question about that. I see them in the shops. But the vast majority, vast, vast majority of goods here are Turkish. Turkish food, Turkish furniture, everything. It's uh, a place where the Turks are making a lot of money. Now, one thing Erdogan could do is to shut the border. That's what I think he's implying here, that they will deprive the opportunities they enjoy. Because Kurds, Kurdistan here, this Iraqi Kurdistan is so dependent on Turkish goods. But if you were to close the border, Turkish businessmen would be losing money and they would be very angry. Now tell me again, though, why Erdogan would be so opposed. I know he has pretty good relations with Iraqi Kurdistan with Barzani now, right? Yeah. Well, uh, everyone knows about the long 30-year war between Turkish Kurds and the Turkish government. Turkey's Kurds have been fighting for independence unsuccessfully now for 30 years. Erdogan actually uh, was the first leader who started to recognize them. He... Uh, allowed them to use the Kurdish language in their school. Uh, he opened up talks with Kurdish Turks and reduced tensions. But that reversed itself in the 2015 election in Turkey, in which 10% of the parliament became was uh, now won by uh, Kurdish by a Kurdish party in Turkey. So uh, he he had to make an alliance with with ultra nationalists to rule. And he started to crack down again on the Kurds, started the war again, horrible scenes of destruction that were missed by the media because of the horrible scenes of destruction in Syria and elsewhere. Uh, it went on about a year last year, at the beginning of last year in particular. They, they really cracked down and killed many civilians and devastated certain Kurdish cities in Turkey. In Turkey, So uh, in general, the, in principle, they don't want a Kurdistan a free independent state in Iraq because of the implications it could have to stir up, again, Turkish Kurds. And uh, the idea, some people here fear, Turks that I know, that the Turkish uh, military could intervene here. I also think that's highly unrealistic. They will keep their troops there to put down any Turkish-Kurdish uprising that could result from the result of the election on Monday. So I think Turkey, the worst they could do is close the border for a week or something, and they may not even do that. They're just talking a big game as well. Um, uh, so, you know, Erdogan, by the way, invited Barzani to come and speak twice now in Turkey and flew the Kurdish regional flag there in Turkey, in Ankara, where he spoke. So this uh, was something unusual, but this is sort of, uh, it's a kind of protectorate, American protectorate here, uh, militarily supported by America, obviously. They're the ones who stopped ISIS from taking over Erbil, where I am. But economically, it's totally dependent on Turkey. So, and Turkey makes a lot of money here as well. I don't think they're going to close the border. If they do, it will be probably not more than a week. These are all predictions. I hope people forget if I'm wrong. But this is what I'm saying now. The other uh, country, of course, is uh, Iran. And some people are worried that Iran would intervene, which is totally, totally crazy idea. Again, the Iranians will be very, uh, I'm sure, alert there on the border and in their Kurdish regions for the impact it might have on their Kurdish population who might start becoming more active and agitating again for independence after seeing the Kurds vote for it in neighboring Iraq. But the idea that the Iranians would divert troops here, as I don't believe the Turks would divert troops here, as they would keep them in Turkey against their own Kurds, uh, the idea that, he, that Turkey would invade, sorry, that Iran would invade Kurdish 
Iraqi Kurdistan and hand on a silver platter, you know, an excuse for the United States and Israel to attack Iran. <laughs> it's not going to do it. They are very well aware of the threats coming from the U.S. and Israel, as we saw at the U.N. again from Netanyahu and Trump just yesterday. They're not going to provoke the U.S. and Israel by invading here, and they don't need to. Uh, they have nothing to do with this. Uh, they are not happy about the re referendum. Of course they're not, because of the impact it would have on their Kurdish population. And then we have Syria, which is uh, Barzani's uh, Iraqi Kurds have relations with them, although, you know, the idea that they would ever join together into a state right now is a fantasy. But the Syrian Kurds are holding their own elections uh, for their local communes in the next couple of weeks, and they're planning in January, I believe, to hold an election to create a regional parliament, basically to set up what they've got here, semi-autonomous state within Syria with their own re regional government, a Syrian uh, Kurdish regional government here in, uh, over there over the border in Syria. Now, right now, of course, since ISIS has still not been vanquished, uh, the Syrians and the Russians and the uh, Iranian allies are still fighting them. Uh, and uh, in 2011, more autonomy was given by Assad to the Syrian Kurds. But from all indications are you would not want to see this uh, Kurdish Syrian gov uh, government, local regional government, become established in a federation. But it remains to be seen whether Assad would have the will, the resources, the backing from Russia to go after them afterward. So the, the Syrian Kurds, I don't think, will be affected so much by this because they're already fighting a war and they already have their own military plans. And lastly, Russia has, I think, played the wisest role here by saying nothing. I, I've been thinking that uh, Baghdad, the Americans, the Brits, the Iranians, the Turks, they're, pre they're creating more attention on this referendum which will not create independence, which will only be a expression of political will of the people, which is a foregone conclusion, and is only a negotiating tool for the Iraqi Kurds with Baghdad to try to eventually get independence through negotiations, which they, which they have to have. I think uh, Russia uh, the, uh, has been quiet about this, and I, don't, I think maybe the other governments should have not brought such attention on this, and only privately di through diplomacy applied pressure, and, and of course kept in close contact with Iraqi uh, Kurdish Iraqi Kurdish officials, rather than making all this bombast and then really not being able to do anything to stop it. I think this is where we are now. Uh, I think it's very much like Brexit in a way. Uh, last time I looked, Britain is still part of the EU. And that election was a year ago, wasn't it? So it's going to be something like that. There'll be an election, but it does not going to change anything legally or materially at first. But the next phase will be these negotiations. The U.S. is threatening... To, to stop these negotiations with Baghdad if they have the vote. So they don't want the Kurds to have this extra leverage in the talks, which the referendum will give them. All right, hang on just one second for me. Hey, guys, check it out. I got a new sponsor. It's Hussein Badakhchani, author of the new book, No Dev, No Ops, No IT, about how to run your high-tech business correctly. No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Badakhchani. It's on Amazon.com. Also, check out The War State by Mike Swanson, a great history of the early rise of the military-industrial complex after World War II. And also check out Mike's great investment advice at wallstreetwindow.com. Roberts & Roberts Brokerage, Inc., when you're ready to follow Mike's advice and buy yourself some medals, that's rrbi.co, rrbi.co, libertystickers.com for your anti-government propaganda, 3tediting.com if you want your book to read right. And that makes sense to me, too, that, that they would certainly have more leverage in the talks after that. And yet you're saying in reaction, the Baghdad government, the Abadi government is saying, no, because we won't talk to you at all. So how much leverage is that? If you go Well, that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. And then, you know, they could say, OK, we're going to declare independence. Then You don't talk to us. We want to do it through negotiations. You're the one stopping the negotiations. We're going to declare independence. Then you have to interview me again to see what kind of reaction the region the neighbors have to that and well that what does happen. baghdad have to lose if they do declare full independence i mean because right they already now, make their own separate oil deals without cutting baghdad in on the share of the profits and all that anyway we've been through that a few years ago right yeah that's really the core of the problem here uh well there are two problems one is oil yes that uh uh kurdish oil is supposed to be sold through the iraqi government and they don't do that where are they selling it for turkey it's another reason why Turkey will probably not close that border, because they're getting oil from the Kurds. And that's illegal, but uh, 
you know, and the Iraqi government says that, by the way, the Supreme Court of Iraq ruled this week that this referendum is illegal, and the Kurds say that that's not true. They interpret the, inter the uh, Constitution differently. Um, the other problem is the disputed areas, which we have to talk about, in particular is Kirkuk. Kirkuk city and province, which is where the most oil is in this region. Mm -hmm. And this was an Arab-majority city before the American invasion in 2003. After the invasion, refuge, Kurdish refugees went to, Kir to Kirkuk and has changed the demographic balance where it's a slight majority Kurdish now. So the idea of holding this referendum in Kirkuk is really incensed Baghdad and the Americans in particular because this is the most volatile issue here. And that seems like that's the kind of thing that they would go to war over possibly. Possibly, control of yes. That city. Yes, the oil that city. Uh, this is probably a mistake from my view. Now, there's evidence Amnesty International did a uh, pretty interesting report a few years ago uh, with some evidence, with satellite evidence and others that pictures that Iraqi Kurds had taken over Arab villages that were abandoned because of the uh, because of ISIS uh, and they did not allow Arabs back again and destroyed Arab homes, sounding like something happens on the West Bank. Uh, the Kurds have denied it, but there seems to be the evidence of that. So they're not completely innocent. They've been victims throughout their history, the Kurds, of all these governments we've been talking about, yeah. all these peoples. Hey, Iranians, listen, um, so yeah. um, in Iraq War II, uh, oh, kill me if I got this wrong. I'm 99.999% sure. Yeah, it must have been. It was Patrick Coburn was there in Mosul at the start of the war. And the Peshmerga basically acted as an auxiliary American force, and they took Mosul as America was invading from the south because, remember, the Turks wouldn't let us invade from Turkey. But we had the, right. the Kurds come in and act uh, as auxiliaries and attack from the north. And he said they occupied Mosul for a few days, and then they realized that, all right, we better get the hell out of here now. <laughs> they were not welcome. It was not their city, and they had forced the Hussein regime, the Ba'athist uh, government and army, out of the country, but they realized pretty quickly they better turn that over to, I guess, was Petraeus got it and ruined everything yeah. after that. But they knew that that was, a, they didn't even want to take it. That was a bridge too far then. They turned around and left before pushing their luck. Uh, right. And so well, I guess that I'm setting up trying to uh, for the question of, well, what about now that they've chased ISIS out of there and died trying a lot of them? And, uh, and it seems like for, same question for Iraqi uh, army and Shiite militia forces and, and others. What are they going to do with Mosul now? Are they going to let the whole population come home? Is there anything to come home to? Or is it going to be a, a change, a ethnically change? And a, a, uh, no, is there going to be a changeover of, of who rules that country from before? Mosul? That city, I mean. Yeah. Well, you know, Petraeus wasn't very welcome either, nor were the Americans. But, no, he sure wasn't. Uh, that is not a Kurdish city. In fact, all he did was uh, arm up the guys who then, as soon as he left, he turned. they turned around and became the insurgency there. Well, that's right. Uh, the thing is, uh, this is not part of the disputed area. They are not claiming Mosul, so that is not part of the equation. Except the timing of this referendum, I suspect, had to do with the victory over ISIS. There's a great feeling of relief here and national pride that they were a big mm. part of defeating, uh, even though the Iraqi army did most of the fighting in the city. Uh, and the Kurds were mostly fighting in villages around uh, around Mosul, which was very important. So that I think on that feeling of victory, he declared this independence, which is one of the reasons the Americans and Baghdad are so much against holding it now, is because ISIS has not been defeated even in Iraq, let alone Syria. They're still fighting, and that this should not be a distraction, and this could be more conflict, although I'm skeptical that there will be a conflict over this at this time. But Mosul, uh, but, but Kirkuk would be the flashpoint for that. Again, mm -hmm. if they vote, and they probably will vote in Kirkuk for independence, doesn't mean that they're independent. Or if they do, uh, and they ever did declare independence, then I think we might see some real, real trouble, maybe violence over Kirkuk. They will not, Baghdad and the Americans probably will not allow Kirkuk to become uh, ruled by Erbil, but mm -hmm. by Baghdad. Uh, it's an Arab city. But the demographics changed because of the American invasion. So the, the, they, they were supposed to have a referendum there to let local people decide which government they wanted to belong to, to Erbil or to Baghdad. But the Iraqis insisted that the people who had come there after 2003 would not be allowed to vote. 
uh, which would mean it would be an Arab majority, and the Kurds said no, they have to vote, they live there, and that's why they've never held this referendum. Mm. Uh, so that's a really, really tense situation there. Now, what about in uh, the eastern provinces at the, you know, because I guess Kirkuk is sort of out to the northwest of Baghdad, right? And so, but what about in yeah. Nineveh province and all that? Are there, well, are Nineveh, there territorial well, flashpoints there? Well, that not with the Kurds, no. Uh, that's Mosul is in Nineveh, and that is... Um, oh, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, I screwed it up. The one that's Ampere. right on the Iranian border, south of Kurdistan. Well, Okay, I'm not sure which one that is, but... Uh, I forget to, sorry. There's no... The, what's interesting is in the east here, in Sulaymaniyya, which is uh, the second largest city here, they're not as fanatic about uh, independence as they are here. They haven't held big rallies. This political party here, Goran, which is the second largest party, which uh, is opposed to the referendum. So it's a really an Erbil thing and a Barzani thing. Barzani is the head of the Barzan tribe. They come from the village of Barzan. Uh, they've been leaders for a hundred years or more, the Barzan family. And uh, Mr. Maliki, who was the vice president, uh, called him, uh, Barzani, a tribal leader, not the president of a, you know, autonomous region. That's how Iraq, uh, Iraqi Arabs see him. Um, so I think that the tension really uh, is going to be focused, if there is tension in Kirkuk mostly, and the other disputed areas, which are mostly rural areas, uh, around Kirkuk and uh, in the east, yes. But the eastern part of this, uh, which is ruled by uh, a different party, which has fought a civil war with Barzani's party, uh, they are not so keen on it, but they have supported it. This is the Talibani uh, tribe. Talibani's people and his party uh, have fought a war with in the 90s with Barzani here, and they fought in the streets here in Erbil. But they have supported the referendum. So, you know, it's going to pass. It's going to pass, but nothing's going to happen right away. Yeah. And I don't think anyone's going to, should overreact. And I think the statements against may have been better to be delivered privately and not to, uh, it's create a lot more attention. You're going to see more stories in the New York Times now. Uh, Western reporters are coming in here. And uh, it's going to be a big deal. And it's going to be a huge celebration. But nothing will change the next day. Uh, but down the road, we're going to see whether the negotiations are stopped, which would spur them to declare independence, or whether they do have negotiations and the threat of independence, declaration of independence, becomes uh, a way for Erbil to get what they want, which is independence, because they have yeah. right now a semi-autonomous uh, region. They they have not a parliament that, effect, that effectively meets. But Hey, tell me they, more about they, the Iranian Kurds here, because... So you talk about the history of after World War II and all of that. Um, but so, I mean, I know so little about this. I know that in the redirection that another uh, Seymour Hersh article there, uh, which is the start of a lot of our current policy now, where it was, you know, CIA backing bin Ladenite types in Lebanon, Syria and Iran. That was Jandala in Iran. But there was also sort of a parenthesis there that they were backing PJAC, which was the Iranian branch of the PKK. And that, so anyway, and then you brought up that, it, you know, if this does happen, the Iranians are not likely to overreact because they don't feel like they have that much to lose in the sense that their Kurdish population is going to try to immediately break away or anything like that, that they need to have a violent overreaction or anything. But so I wonder, you know, what all you can tell us about them and, how inclined they might be to want to join with the Iraqi Kurds if they could and that kind of thing? Uh, uh, there's no talk of that at all, but uh, I do think there's a real chance that they will start to protest and uh, rise up and cause trouble for the Iranians. And I think we could, I would not be surprised to see crackdown on Iranian Kurds following this referendum uh, and violence there inside uh, Iran, in northern Iran where the Kurds live. Um, but like I said, they had, a, they had a state for a year. It was crushed. Their leaders were executed. Iran will not tolerate an independent Kurdish state inside their, was their, what their, was their country and still is. And uh, yes, the, the Kurds dream of linking up all the Kurds from the four countries in which they are they're living. But um, this is a wild fantasy right now. Only because, and not that they don't have a, you know, legitimate argument for that. I'm not against uh, on principle, 
the idea of the Kurds having a state. They've been victims of all of these governments. They are a separate people. They, uh, they have a separate language and separate culture, different mentality than the Arabs. They are a different people, and they're very proud. And, uh, but the political realities are that they are not. Uh, the only thing they might get is independence here in Iraq, but that doesn't look likely either. They're going to get a referendum and not independence. I don't right. think that the Iranian Kurds and the Iraqi Kurds uh, joining together is really something that one mm-hmm. could expect well, to and- be talked and even where you know that you have the PKK in Turkey and the YPG in Syria and yeah. the PJAC in Iran, Barzani's, Barzani's faction, Talibani, those guys are basically just in Iraqi Kurdistan, and, and they don't have that kind of transnational pseudo commie kind of uh, network thing going on that these other groups have. So it's not like if, if the Iraqi branch of the PKK was in control and they were declaring independence— that right. might really make the Turks freak out, right? Or that kind of thing. No, in totally fact, Barzani, Barzani has allowed uh, continuous bombing from Turkish F-16s inside Iraqi territory here uh, against PKK. Continuous? Kurdish. I mean, I know from time to time, but does that really happen very often? I think it happened last week, another one. Oh, this man. doesn't get reported anymore. They, they are hitting Tur- Turkish PKK who are on this side of the border. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, who are aiding the PKK inside Turkey. So uh, Barzani does not stop, and Iraq doesn't stop Turkey, it's Iraqi territory, as far as Baghdad is concerned, mm-hmm. uh, from, from uh, striking inside this country. So, yes, they've been opposed to the PKK, for the most part, the uh, uh, Barzani Kurds. And you're right, it's, he, although he did spend time in the Soviet Union as a young man, and there is an Iraqi Communist Party here that's not very big, but I pass its headquarters very often hmm. on the road here, on the 60 meters road, uh, and I knew the son of the leader of the uh, Iraqi Communist Party. Uh, it's a secular country, but it's certainly not socialist. You know, they like business here. Um, it's secular in the sense that there's no religious, uh, women don't have to cover their heads, that kind of thing. Right. Although many do, but they, they don't have to. Um, now, listen, I want to ask you about Iraq War Three and Mosul and all this stuff, too. But first, one last thing on this whole uh, Kurdish independence or half step toward it and this kind of thing in Iraq is what exactly is Israel's interest in breaking off Kurdistan from Baghdad's control here? It's very strong interest. And they've opened, even Netanyahu said something about it the other day that is in favor. And I think there's two factors here. Again, uh, the Arab states, uh, even though now there's a, you know, now there's a Shia government here in Baghdad, very close to Iran. Iran has a lot of influence here. Yeah. Israel sees Iran as its biggest enemy, and it once saw Iraq as as big an enemy with Saddam. Uh, the idea of breaking up large, potentially powerful states like Iraq was under Saddam. Uh, is is something that they have sought. Uh, that Syria being broken up and devastated is good for their security. Their number one issue is their security. Uh, they only have, of course, a deal with peace deal with, with Jordan and Egypt, not with Iraq, not with Syria, obviously. So to break up uh, Iraq into uh, three pieces would be even better, I think, which Joe Biden, if you remember, was supportive of. Another thing is they could operate more from here. Uh, if they had an embassy... Uh, you know, it borders with Iran, and if there are any Iranian, any Israeli operations inside Iranian territory, which is not a far-fetched idea, we know, of course, about cyber attacks that took place against the Iranian nuclear program that was run by Israel and the U.S. But if if they want to uh, run commando operations or Mossad, uh, whatever, inside Iran, they have a border here. So I think that could be another possibility where they would want to get a foothold here. But that they've been supporting Kurdish independence for a long time. And I don't think that's because they really care about the Kurdish people too much. I think they care about their own interests, which every government does. And uh, those are the two reasons I think that Israel is supportive of Kurdish independence. But it won't matter if only Kurdistan and Saudis, for the same reason, uh, with their uh, hatred of Iran, you know, they could also help stir up Kurdish uh, Iranians because that's the border here between Kurdistan and, and Iran is borders with, Kurd, with Iraqi Kurds. So if they want to aid the Iranian 
uh, independence movement of the Kurds, which I think uh, Israel would love. They could do that more easily too, maybe, if they didn't have to deal with a Baghdad government who claims sovereignty over this territory. If it was, in Israel, if it was a Kurdish government, that would feel indebted to Israel for being one of the only countries to recognize them. You know, they'll never be a member of the UN. I think a lot of Kurds here fantasizing, you know, Barzani maybe speaking at the General Assembly or uh, Kurds winning a gold medal somewhere. It's not going to happen. There's not going to be recognition by enough countries, even if they do declare independence. And that would question then their legality under the Grant of Video Convention, which I began this conversation about, that they need a certain number. And it's never been determined how many, uh, but they need, a, you know, a substantial number of countries to recognize them, and they would never become, uh, you know, an, uh, a member of the UN or anything like that. So this Israel, uh, it's interesting, their involvement here. It's, I think a lot of it is covert, but uh, obviously, uh, but they are now overtly calling for independence. And the Saudis, I think, also would like to have some way to maybe to undermine Iran through the Kurdish region. This is just my guess. Yeah. Well, I've actually been surprised in the past about how open the Israelis are about how badly they want to see this. It seems like that would be counterproductive if they announced to the world that, yeah, that's what we want here you know on what? the Likud party, that that would cause a negative reaction that would make it less likely somehow. But they have been very blatant about this for many years, I think. A, member, a foreign ministry official here, the foreign ministry of the Kurdish regional government, made that exact statement, I think, two or three days ago. No, they appreciate Israel's support, but they prefer they didn't say it out loud. He actually said that. He did say that. That's counterproductive. It could hurt us. We don't really want, you know, this to be known. Seems pretty so, obvious, that's a good right? But, yeah. Yep. Huh. yep. All right. So now, I guess, can you update us on the status of Mosul? And, uh, you know, we are talking about the Peshmerga here and, and their war, as you say, against the Islamic State is sort of the background of this whole conversation as well that they have successfully rousted the Islamic State out of Mosul, but not all of Iraq, you said. Uh, how's how's the Battle of Talafar going? Isn't that over? I believe it is, uh, about two or three weeks ago. That was an important battle. That's, that links um, Iran by a road to, to Syria and then on into Lebanon. Talafar was in a very strategic battle. Uh, look, uh, I hope to be able to get to Mosul at some point. I have not. Uh, but, you know, one thing we have to keep in mind here is 40,000 people were killed there uh, in that American attack, yeah. American led attack on Mosul. And I obviously ISIS came about through the support of American regional allies and the United States as a way to put pressure on Assad. They didn't expect it to become the Frankenstein it did perhaps where they then had to fight it but the US has big responsibility for this mess and then instead of cutting off aid to them and oil sales and whatnot and arms you know they uh, did not stop ISIS until they had to kill 40,000 people uh, the old city of Mosul which looks like an absolute treasure has been devastated and you know they're trying to rebuild they're putting in water systems and electricity, and they're trying to get back on their feet. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to take, but they have suffered enormously because of this whole outrageous uh, development of uh, Islamic State here that started out as a project to overthrow uh, Assad, really, in East Syria. And would never have happened if the Americans had not invaded Iraq and if they hadn't been trying to overthrow Assad. Two secular guys, not Saddam being, of course, much worse, not real democratic figures, but uh, they had stability and they kept Islamic extremists at arm's length. And that has been disturbed by American interests here. Uh, so right now, uh, Mosul is not in the news because there's no more fighting going on there. And that's good news, but there is no news there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very happy to hear that. As you said, the 40,000. Now, I read that, of course, in Patrick Coburn in The Independent. Yes. And he had gotten that from uh, right. Kurdish sources, that that was their military intelligence estimates and this Zabadi. kind of thing. Zabadi. Zabadi, who was the foreign minister of Iraq. He's a Kurd. Uh -huh. He was the foreign minister of Iraq. I met him several times at the UN. He was very friendly with Western journals. He, yes, he sat down with Patrick Coburn, showed him an intelligence, Iraqi, sorry, a Kurdish intelligence report. Mm-hmm. 
that had that figure of 40,000. It was not widely reported. Well, and Patrick sure oh, believed it, and he's the kind of guy who would know yeah. if he was in a city believe, full of 40,000 corpses or not. You know, you can't. I believe it. He's got that when kind you look of experience. At the destruction of that, of that area of tightly, uh, you know, very narrow streets, very densely populated. When you look at that destruction and the idea that 40,000 died is not hard to believe. Yeah. But it's also not hard to believe the New York Times is not going to publicize that right. because they were going off on the Russians killing 900 to 1,000 civilians in Aleppo, which was genocide, yeah. to drive out similar type of, of jihadists. Well, and I talked with Patrick about it, and he was saying, listen, it's, you know, the Islamic State held the civilian population hostage and wouldn't let them run, and the Americans are just bombarding them from the air, and then Iraqi forces are just bombarding them with artillery, and then, yeah, man, what do you think's going to happen? That's Equals right. 40,000. This war, this happened for 10 months, right? It was as long as the whole Libya war. So... Yeah, yeah. 40,000 people died. What do you think is going to happen? They're in a, it's a canned hunt like Dick Cheney goes on. It's a city of 2 million people. There were a million left there. So 40,000, it's a lot of people. Uh, but it's not hard to believe. All right. So now, I, man, I'm sorry to keep you so long here. We're right yeah, on now. I'll let you go if you need to go. Right. Yeah, well, one more. So because uh, you know lots of things and people like hearing you say them, I think. I do. Um so there's a whole uh, a change of situation going on in eastern Syria now. Uh, what used to be Western Islamic State is now again eastern Syria, I guess, as Raqqa is under siege. The YPG, with some Arab forces mixed in, uh, work with the Americans and lay in siege there. But then you got the Russian and, and Iranian-backed Syrian government forces, and they've recently... Um, I know this much. I hope you'll be able to help elaborate... They roused to the Islamic State out of Deir Ezzor, finally, and then so Raqqa's all they got left, and then, but I saw the other day that the Americans were whining and complaining, and maybe quite dangerously, that the Syrian army had crossed the deconfliction line, and I believe the Euphrates River, where they said that they wouldn't, bringing the American-backed um, so-called SDF, those YPG forces, yeah. uh, really right there within range of the Iranian and uh, Syrian government forces there. So anyway, I was just wondering, any any corrections you can make to that or any elaboration you can make on that and the situation in Raqqa, I sure would appreciate. No, I, I, I do know that the Americans said afterward that they would, that the Russians or the Syrians had bombed close to where these American-backed forces were, but that they would try to work together on that, which is good. Uh, I think the battle for Raqqa is still, you know, the race for Raqqa, as it's been called now for almost a year or more, is still going on. And that's going to be crucial to find out uh, who's going to gain control of that city. And um, that could determine the future of eastern Syria, whether it becomes controlled by the Americans uh, or not. And I, uh, right now, it looks like the Americans are there to stay. they got lots of people and they're flying their flag as they drive around. They're not secretly there. Uh, they're not more than special forces, I think. So um, Syria has become so complex, uh, the east of Syria, what's going on right there. Uh, and I haven't focused as much on that as I have now on Iraq. But uh, I would say that we're going to hopefully see within weeks a resolution of the Raqqa battle, and that could effectively end ISIS's control, or there'll be pockets of these guys as there are here in Iraq. And then we're going to see who's going to be in control of Raqqa and what the Kurds do with the victory that they will celebrate. They have contributed a great deal towards the uh, defeat of ISIS. Um, going back a couple of years when they were fighting in Kobani, if you remember. Um, I think I think we don't know yet. I'm not going to venture that. I'm only going to, on this show, I'm only going to predict what's going to happen after this Iraqi referendum. Not what's going to happen in Syria. I <laughs> stay away from that. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, listen, man, I'll let you go. But thank you very much All for right. coming back on the show, Joe. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome, Scott. Good to talk to you again. Yep. All the best. All right, you guys, that is Joe Laureate. The book is How I Lost by Hillary Clinton. It's all block quotes of her. The whole thing is just her explaining what a horrible person she is and how horrible she is on every single issue. And it's just really annotated and narrated in a sense. Uh, by Joe. It's really great. I mean, I, I read the whole thing uh, in no time. I enjoyed it. It's great. Um, and then, so yeah, he's, uh, you and Joe 
Uh, I used to write for the London Times and the Wall Street Journal and all these things. Now he's camping out in Irbil in Kurdistan, uh, writing for Consortium News and uh, coming on this show to tell you and me. All right. Uh, Again, the book is How I Lost by Hillary Clinton, parentheses, Joe Loria. And I'm Scott Horton. Check out scotthorton.org for all the archives. 4,500-something interviews for you there. And um, foolserrand.us for my book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, just out. And uh, follow me on Twitter, at Scott Horton Show. Thanks.